The Salter Harris classification system describes fractures of the growth plate. In order to understand this system, we need to keep a few basic concepts in mind and review the anatomy of long bones. Number one, we're talking about the pediatric population, which means these children are still growing. The presence of a growth plate means that this bone still has potential to grow. Number two, we have to understand, well, what is a growth plate? A growth plate is synonymous with the terms epiphyseal plate and physis, or secondary center of ossification. And throughout this presentation, I will use all these terms interchangeably so that you get used to hearing them all. Number three, and this will probably, probably be one of the most important concepts, is this concept of unit, meaning the entire growth plate grows together simultaneously in a very predictable pattern and it covers the entire width from medial to lateral, cortex to cortex. So why is this important? Because although it grows together and closes together, it is very possible that a certain type of fracture, which we will talk about, can cause premature closure of one side of the growth plate, while the other side continues to grow. And this can lead to long-term growth disturbances like a bowing or angular type of deformity. And again, we'll talk about that in a moment. And number four, just some basic anatomy of long bones. And again, keep in mind, we are talking about long bones. So this system does not apply to the tarsal bones, the carpal bones, or the vertebrae. Is that in the long bone, the longest part is called the diaphysis, also known as the shaft. On either side of the diaphysis, you have a portion where the bone flares out. And that is known as the metaphysis. And you have two of these. And finally, at the proximal and distal ends, we have the epiphyses. Do not confuse the term epiphysis with physis. Remember, physis is a growth plate. Epiphysis is a proximal or distal end of the long bone. And finally, regarding blood supply, blood supply enters from the proximal, I mean the diaphysis or the metaphysis, from either the proximal or the distal ends of this portion of the long bone. It does not enter from the epiphysis. And why is that? Because the epiphysis is surrounded by hyaline cartilage. And hyaline cartilage does not allow blood supply to enter from there. This is where the joints would be. And before we continue, just so you guys remember from your basic histology about the growth plate, if you guys recall, it has a number of layers. If you guys remember the zone of proliferation, zone of ossification, calcification, germinal layer. If you need help with that, I highly recommend you go back, review your histology notes, and then come back and watch this video. And then now we're ready to jump into the different types. And before we end the video, we're going to go through some of the newer classification systems that were added in addition to the Salter-Harris, namely the Rang's ring classification, which is really just type 6, and the Ogden classification, which is type 7, 8, and 9 of pediatric long bone fractures. One thing that I forgot to mention during the anatomy review is the location of the growth plate. Some authors will say it is found along the metaphysis, while others will say it is found in the metaphyseal epiphyseal junction, but basically is found at the proximal or distal ends of the long bones. A type 1 is a transverse fracture that can either go just above the growth plate or right through the physis. And what end up happening is that the entire growth plate or part of it will end up being displaced from the metaphysis. The epiphysis is not injured nor is a metaphysis. It's just a separation. These tend to be non-displaced and extra articular. So, and they're very difficult to see on x-ray. So you have to rely on your history and physical. What do you look for? You look for swelling in that area and positive pain on palpation and of course a history of trauma to that area. In a type 2 fracture, the entire epiphysis and a portion of the metaphysis is broken off. There is no injury to the epiphysis and there is a fracture of the metaphysis. This little metaphyseal fragment is called the thurston holland sign. Type 2 is the most common Salter-Harris type of fracture 
and it tends to occur in children that are a bit older, like 6 to 7 years old. Whereas type 1 tends to occur in younger children, maybe around 2 to 5 years old. In type 3, a portion of the epiphysis along the portion of the growth plate is separated from the metaphysis and the remainder of the epiphysis. These are really quite rare, and when they do happen, they occur in the distal aspect of the tibia, specifically a tilo fracture, which is a fracture of the anterior tubercle. So these are intraarticular. Remember, types 1 and 2 were not intraarticular and did not fracture the epiphysis. Now we're finally entering intraarticular fractures. So these patients, although these are quite rare, are prone to chronic disability, such as osteoarthritis of the affected joint. And these tend to occur in teenagers. A type 4 is a vertical fracture that extends from the metaphysis through the epiphyseal plate and then exits out of the epiphysis, making these intraarticular. So if you could imagine that this entire piece is just broken off the remainder of the bone. These tend to occur in the humerus and the tibia. A very interesting variation of a type 4 is something called a triplane fracture, and these occur in the tibia. Now in order to understand a triplane fracture, Let's take a step back and review some concepts and some anatomy. Normally, in the distal tibia, the epiphyseal plate closes over an 18-month transitional period. And that occurs between the age of 16 and 18. So these fractures are unique to that age group. The medial portion of the physis closes first, and over an 18-month period, slowly the lateral portion also closes. And because the medial portion begins to close first, the lateral portion is more vulnerable to injury. Now, why is it called triplane? Because the injury or the fracture line crosses all three planes. If you only took an AP of this type of fracture, you're going to think you only have a type 3 Salter Harris fracture because all you're going to see is an epiphyseal fracture that is in the sagittal plane. But this fracture line doesn't just stop here. It starts anterior, stays in the sagittal plane, and once it reaches the epiphyseal plate, it turns lateral. And again, that makes sense. It's not going to turn medial, it's going to turn lateral because the lateral part is weaker. So the, so the injury turns lateral, or the fracture line continues lateral. And then it doesn't just stop there. It actually continues now in the coronal plane. It goes posterior and medial, which is why you won't see this part, this portion of the fracture line most times on an AP. If you took a lateral of the ankle and all you saw was this, you're going to think you have a classic type 2 Salter Harris fracture because you're only going to see the Thurston Holland sign, which is a metaphyseal fragment. So what makes these unique? is as a combination of a type 2 and a type 3. And you need to order an AP or an ankle mortis, and you need to order a lateral to appreciate all aspects of this type of fracture. Type 5 is a crush injury to the growth plate. The epiphysis and the metaphysis are not injured. There could be a partial compression or a complete compression. In the long term, what's the difference? Well, if only one part of the growth plate was compressed during the injury, the other part remains open and will continue to grow. So this child will grow up to have an angular or some type of bowing deformity of that bone. If it's a complete compression, then this bone will possibly never grow again, and in the long term can lead to a limb length inequality. These tend to occur in the ankle or sometimes even the knees if a child falls from a height. A type 6 is known as a Rang's ring fracture and it is injury to the zone around Vier. If you guys remember from histology, the zone around Vier is responsible for providing chondrocytes so that the growth plate can continue to expand in diameter. If an injury occurs to this place, the bone will still grow longitudinally but it will no longer grow in its diameter. The Ogden classification covers types 7, 8, and 9. 
What makes these unique is that the growth plate itself is not injured. In type 7, the injury occurs to the epiphysis. These may or may not be intraarticular. An Ogden type 8 is a fracture that occurs in the metaphysis. If you remember from the beginning of the video, we said that for long bones, the blood supply enters from the diaphysis and the metaphysis. So although the epiphyseal plate is not directly injured, if the blood supply is somehow disrupted by this type of fracture, then indirectly there may be some long-term growth disturbance to the epiphyseal plate. Finally, an Ogden type 9 is an injury that occurs to the diaphysis. The periosteum of the diaphysis is stripped off. These are often seen with degloving type injuries, like what you would see in a motorcycle accident, for example.